That's always a good way to start a video, isn't it? Um, this here is Torque Brewing's Roundabout English Dark Mild Ale. This is a video I've been meaning to make since uh, early 2018. And it's about this cheap soldering station over here, which so many of you have complained about. But uh, enough of you, as a matter of fact, that one of you decided to uh, step up and actually donate uh, higher end iron, uh, this here T12, which once I get some more tips for it, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on it. But for right now, it's the Beku that I'm going to look into. I'm going to open up the box, which like I said, I should have done years ago, but whatever. That's what's happening today. So what else can I say about it? It's worked for me for a couple of years. It hasn't failed on me. It hasn't electrocuted me. Um, it hasn't uh, blown up or done anything unpredictable. It's been a reasonable thing, especially for the cheap price. When, when it comes to, to tools and actually most things related to, to hobby stuff, I tend to lean towards some advice that I heard Adam Savage give one time. I, 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 have been doing this since long before I knew who he was, but uh, it sort of confirms my suspicion that if you don't have a tool and you need a tool for a job or for a, for a task, especially something non-critical, like a hobby task, buy the cheapest viable tool you can. If you use it a lot, then buy a good one once the first one breaks. But start with a cheap one because you don't know necessarily how much you're going to be using it. That, that's how I approach most of my my hobby stuff. I mean, most of those tools back there were all bought super cheap. Um, and actually, I don't think there's anything in that selection back there that I've had to buy twice. Because I don't use them professionally. I don't use them heavy duty. They get the job done. And when I was looking for a hobby soldering station to upgrade from a bunch of non-temperature controlled irons that I've had forever, some of which I bought at Radio Shack in Canada back when they existed, back when I was a teenager, um, some I've had from various other places, that's probably the best of them. And again, that's just a 35 watt plug in the wall iron. Um, it just runs at whatever temperature it runs at and it, it does the job, but tips because they have the Weller brand on them aren't really expensive so I went looking for something else I found this guy and it's been serving me well for a couple of years and it still works fine it hasn't given me any trouble at all so when I bought this thing back in early 2018 it cost me 75 bucks now it's about 80 dollars uh, which still puts it cheapest in class for something like that yeah, it's it's not the best. It's not professional grade. It's certainly not Weller. It's not Heiko, even though it's sort of slightly pretending to be kind of, sort of. And it does use the same replacement parts as Heiko, uh, the same tips, the, the same form factor of iron handle and voltage, and even the plug. So at least that stuff was easy to get a hold of, even, yeah, that sleeve there. And I bought it from a Canadian seller, so I figured I was slightly less risk of sending, you know, 75 bucks away than if I was sending it to some sweatshop in China. I don't know, maybe that's just me. But anyway, the specs of the thing, such as they are, um, 110 volts uh, power, North American, that's fine. Total consumption, 750 watts. Uh, the iron temperature, 200-480C, the heat gun, 100 to 500. And I've used this quite a lot for heat shrink, um, set down to about 150 or so, just so I don't burn my hand. And I've also used it for both solder, desoldering and reflowing surface mount. And it works just perfectly well for that. So, the first thing that uh, a lot of people ask me about when I first got this thing is to open it up and make sure that it's... Uh, that is grounded it won't be so that's that question answered um the only minor annoyance i had with this thing 
the uh, there's a little magnet in here and there's a magnetic sensor in here so that when you hang it up on on its stand it goes into cool down mode until the temperature drops down to you know uh, two digit number and then it shuts off um, but it wasn't quite doing it so I had to put this elastic band on here just to position it exactly right so maybe while I'm in there I'll try and reposition that but that's that's the literally the only problem this thing's given me it does have a fuse uh, it says in the back here push 8 amps uh, and if you recall on the website it said this is good for about 750 watts do the math 750 watts and 110 to 120 volts that's close ish to 8 amps okay let's see what's under the cover we have a transformer uh, 110 volt 50 60 Hertz input to 26 volts 10 volts and 32 volts on the three different taps so one of these pairs of windings will be 26 volts, one will be 10 volts, one will be 32 volts. And it looks like they all go up to the front here. Ah, so there is some grounding to the case here. Um, there is a wire that goes to the front that's grounded to the case. And there's a wire that goes into this handle that's grounded to the case. But of course the case itself isn't grounded. I probably should replace that cord at some point here. It looks like everything is mounted to the front panel by the nuts on these guys so okay there is the board so these two are pots uh, both 10 K's this one is a rotary encoder for the uh, for the power setting there so there's basically the two sections of it this side is the heat gun and this side is the soldering iron actually these two controls are the heat gun so there's kind of the divide there um got a couple of uh well, three different uh 220 power devices on heat sinks and another one just sitting that's 7805 it's marked it there which is a regulator um, I can't see markings for the other ones. Is it BT136 or 8T136? Oh, okay. It's a Triac. This one's a Dash 600. So it is 4 amps, uh, 500 volt. Okay, that's reasonable enough. And unfortunately, I can't get at the other ones. This connector is gooped in place, so I can't pull it off to see what's back there though that is a nice touch that they've uh, they've adhered some of these connectors especially well that's the connectors for the um, AC mains and one of the three uh, windings going from the transistor transformer okay and the connector for the iron those wires come up over here and ah I don't really want to take off all these good down connectors that is nice of them to do that that way it's a pain in the ass for servicing but it means they're not going to vibrate loose which is a good thing try to get a look at some of these other components but they've also got what is that lm358 that's an op amp could be being used for measuring the, the uh, thermistor or it could be being used as a comparator kind of hard to tell there's a bridge rectifier down there with, which makes sense with these capacitors and the 7805 and these blue and yellow wires are coming from the transformer so that's creating the 5 volt power supply for this guy which is SN8P2714KB so this is as close as I could get to that one um, this matches it does say Sonics on the chip and SN27 is the start. All of these are 8-bit microcontrollers with various different features, ADCs and op-amp comparators and stuff like that built into them. Here's just one of them uh, randomly, but they all seem to be very similar inside. So it's, 
you know, it's just doing microprocessor kind of things. It's measuring the analog inputs and it's controlling outputs, including, I assume, driving that LC or that LED for the temperature, uh, measuring the temperatures. Yeah, normal microcontroller stuff. Nothing, nothing surprising, but nothing that we can easily dive down deeper into without the software. And I'm not going there. So before I button this thing back up completely, I'm going to replace the power cord with a proper grounded power cord and ground it to there. Um, so th this shouldn't be that difficult really. A uh, bit of shrink tube and solder that together, solder it onto there and put a crimp ring onto there and screw it down. And just use a random IEC cable which I have an almost infinite number of kicking around here. Yes, I know it's probably not the right crimper, but it's what I have. So I am going to have to use the new and improved soldering iron to fix the old one. <laughs> Some kind of uh, justice there. Thanks again for sending me this. There's the neutral soldered together. Slide a bit of heat shrink over it, just like it was before. Just quickly give that a shrink. That's not the most effective way of doing it. Using the heat gun would be the most effective way of doing it, but that's not possible right this second. Here's the next most effective way of doing it. The way I've done it for years, backstages and other random places. Okay. Now then I'm going to slide two pieces of shrink over this one. A small one that'll cover the wire itself and a slightly larger one that'll go up over that uh, terminal there. And that's in there, but it doesn't have enough solder on it. I would like to get a good solid blob on there. That ought to hold it. Now then, how am I going to heat shrink that on? These two ground wires on there. This is awkward AF to get in here. Put that nut back on that I didn't really need to take off. Hey, there's those two. And pull this guy out a little bit. And there's my fork terminal. No, it's not ideal. No, it's not, not even proper. But it's better than what was there before, which was no ground at all. I'll just spin this guy down. Okay, so that goes on like that. And squeezes down to go in through the hole. You've seen these things, right? It just pushes the wire down in kind of a bend that shape down into the bottom so that it's strain relieved. It's, like I said, it does the job. It's kind of an awkward connector to put on. Or an awkward strain relief. You need to sort of squeeze it down while pushing it through the hole. And... There, well, that sort of worked. With the help of the plungers pliers, I am going to do something ill-advised. I'm going to plug this guy in. No sparks, good. I am going to turn this on. It's going to heat up to 250 some. And then I'm going to use it to shrink its own heat shrink. Keeping a safe distance, I'm a couple of centimeters away because that is the live wire. This one's the neutral here, and I'll just give him a little bit more. And there, that ought to hold it. Okay, so I've got it all back together again and tested it and it all works. The only thing left is to figure out this little sensor in here. And as you saw before, there is a little magnet in this. And if I take my neodymium magnet, I should be able to trigger a sensor right in here. 
It's right on the side there. And that shuts off the heating element and kicks it into high wind and you can see the temperature dropping here. Now the same thing should happen when I put it into here. And it does, except for not when it's holding on its own. So that's my cheap solution there. But obviously that's not a very elegant solution. It's been serving me well for two years, but you know, should do something about it. Let's get this guy open. There's a couple of Phillips screws there, and I think, yeah, that unscrews from there. Now that barrels, I mean, it's still 100 Celsius, so it's, I probably shouldn't be touching it directly right now, but I'll let it cool down, then I'll take it apart. Okay, now then this thing should just clamshell apart. So there's a little squirrely cage blower. Oh, there you can see there's a little circuit board. It's just a terminating board. Oh, there's the mag switch there. Okay. Let's see if I can drag this out of here. It is a little reed switch. Okay. Can you see that in there? So it's literally two little reeds that when a magnet comes close to them, they move and make contact. No, that's really hard to see. But I think if I just rotate it in its housing a little bit, it might be more effective or maybe it'll be less effective. I don't know. Or maybe I'm just going to have to live with this or maybe I have to put a more powerful magnet in. There we go. Screw that back on. I still don't have it screwed at the tail end, but that's okay for this experiment. just needs to be sitting a little bit higher hmm let's see if there's anything that can be learned underneath here maybe I can move that magnet or maybe I can put a stronger one in there so I do have a few magnets kicking around here so there's a magnet on this side and there's a magnet on this side so I guess that means you can put that in that way up or that way up and it doesn't matter okay let's see if we can dig that out and just see what that magnet looks like Okay, so there is the magnet, and it just drops down into there. So I wonder if one of these guys will drop down into there too. Hmm, that's a little bit bigger magnet. No, it doesn't look like it wants to. What else have I got? Just when I thought the battle had been lost, there it goes. If I put it the other way, there it is. It's actually holding. So what I did, let me just, let me just cool this thing down for a second and I'll show you what I did. So what I did was when I was shoving that magnet back in there I just pried it down so that it was behind this pillar and that was enough to move it just like the width of that screwdriver which is all it really needed and now it works so I'm just going to do the other one and I'll hot melt that back in there again and we'll be done okay we're all back together now then I turn that on it should just sit there and not do anything. Yeah. So I pick it up. And then away it goes. That's what's supposed to happen. And it works both ways up. Perfect. Okay, no more need for that elastic band. That's excellent. And that still works. That's great. Just let that wind down. All right. So this guy is now 100%. And as I said at the beginning, this hasn't let me down. It's had a couple of minor annoyances, but it hasn't let me down since I got it. Um, yeah, it's the cheapest available. That's the way I normally roll. But I am going to be using this T12 a lot more in the future. 
especially or especially once I get uh, some smaller tips for it. And I may modify this holder because it's for the aluminum handle, not the plastic one. Or I may just order the aluminum handle. I haven't decided yet. Anyway, it it holds it well enough, and I do like this uh, the feature of having that uh, that scrubber holder plus the sponge. Well, I hope uh, hope that was slightly interesting for you guys. I uh, this is like I said, this is something I've been meaning to do since I got this thing, and I just never got around to it. So now I've gotten around to it. Thanks for watching. Comments, questions, you know the drill. Talk to you later.